Welcome to this special Alliance Digital Gathering episode of Equally Valued, where we bring together the insights of Scotland's largest third sector intermediary for health and social care. With the journalism of Health and Care Scotland to focus on an issue on the day of, for health and social care across Scotland. I'm Alan Falls, a Policy and Information Officer for the Health and Social Care Alliance Scotland. And I'm Frankie McPherson, one of the reporters at Health and Care News Scotland. So what to expect in this episode? We'll start with a roundtable conversation with a range of stakeholders on the issue of fuel poverty. Following on from this will be a one-to-one interview with Carolyn Hunter, a campaigner, mother and carer for her daughter Freer, who has severe and complex health needs. We initially spoke with Carolyn in April about her experience facing fuel poverty with the need for essential medical equipment running alongside heating for her daughter Freya. Today we'll be hearing what life has been like for her family after more than nine months. With the UK government deciding not to increase tax for the major energy suppliers, individuals and families across the country were set to be affected with uh, hitting our societies most vulnerable the hardest. In April 2022, the Equally Value podcast explored this unfolding issue. We recorded the impact it was set to have and discussed the ways in which the Scottish and UK government could prevent unnecessary hardship. Now, in the midst of winter, we aim to consider the current situation for people in Scotland who are struggling to heat their homes and the impact on their health and well-being. We look at the actions and support delivered by government and what more could and should have been done. We're joined today by Kira Bolton, a research assistant and project coordinator for mapping data systems with a focus on fuel, fuel poverty and housing. Mark McLeod from Energy Saving Trust, the Fuel Poverty Partnerships Manager for Home Energy Scotland, and Tony Kane, Senior Community Links Officer with the Alliance. So, let's start off with a simple question. Um, We've seen the increasing numbers of people and households in in fuel poverty in Scotland. This was estimated to be around one in four pre-pandemic, with the Scottish Government's estimate of around one in three by last April, April, then rising again, with the most recent Child Poverty Action Group research revealing that January 2023 will see those in fuel poverty reaching 62% of Scotland. While this alone is alarming, many think figures underestimate the reality facing Scots today. How should we be defining fuel poverty to ensure that no one is left behind in terms of dedicating support? Anyone want to jump in? Let's go with Kira. Um, So I think defining fuel poverty is a very complicated issue. And I think um, we're very far away from a solution. But I can talk about some of the issues that are associated with the current definition. Um, Through our research at the university, it's been easier to simplify these issues into two types. So firstly, there are issues um, with uh, the definition's accuracy, um, its applicability and its fairness. Um, There's a different definition in Scotland versus England, and that's because there's no consensus on the fairest or the best way to measure fuel poverty. And even within Scotland, um, uh, as recently as 2019, there's been adjustments to the definition. And the second issue is where a lot of our research focuses. Um, So it's in the application of the definition. So the definition is is very technical and it's tricky to apply in practice. So um, for instance, the first part of Scotland's definition is um, the 10% adjusted household income for um, an adequate um, satisfactory heating regime. Uh, So I think it's you'd be really hard pushed to find a household that firstly knows what their adjusted household income is um, and also knows whether they fit either of the two types of heating regime regulations um, as these heating regime regulations differ on household type. Um, And it it just means that there is a, a lot of limitations in applying it and there's a lot of unknowns. And Mark, how do you see that playing out in your role? So we don't, um, at Home Energy Scotland, we don't measure uh, fuel poverty. We don't, you know, try and assess people specifically to see whether they're in fuel poverty. What we do is we use a broad set of questions to give people the opportunity to tell us based, you know, based on their experience of how they are finding um, whether they've got issues heating their home or they feel that they've got issues um, paying their fuel bills. Um, we use that to to assess whether or not people are experiencing it. So we don't look at doing a specific measurement based on any of the definitions. Um, and that approach enables us to support people more widely and enables people to self-identify where they need specific support from us. 
Yeah, I was just going to pick up on that point about sort of the, the definition. Kira mentioned that sort of 10% figure, and we're sort of seeing if, if 62% of people are coming under that in Scotland, how useful is that sort of figure? Because there isn't really any distinction between someone who is at that 10% point mm-hmm. and someone who's at 20%. So there isn't really that kind of distinction between sort of almost like what you can think of as mild, moderate and severe Extreme, fuel yeah. poverty. Mm-hmm. And if we're if we were to address sort of measures that are meant to assist people who are in fuel poverty and we just go, oh, well, it's for everyone who's in fuel poverty, you're not necessarily targeting the people who are in most need of the support. So there's, there's, I think there's something quite important there about how we, how we sort of factor in sort of the severity of fuel poverty people yeah. are in. And what ways have um, each of us sort of seen people managing to reach the most vulnerable? Um, have you encountered any challenges as a community? I mean, I speaker? think, just firstly, it's interesting listening to the way we were talking about breaking down the definition. It's not in terms of service delivery. Mm-hmm. Our links practitioners are, are seeing people every day, and we're just responding to an area of routine inquiry. So we'll ask people, is finance an issue? Is cost of living crisis an issue? Mm-hmm. As part of our routine inquiry, and we're obviously getting a lot of referrals. You know, I think in our we sent out data to the practices about what the gaps and challenges are. And I think for 80% of them, they came back with a cost of living crisis and fuel poverty being an yeah. issue based on their experience of working with people. Now, we work in areas of deprivation. The yeah. Links programme works in areas of deprivation, so we are seeing it a lot. Um, but it's hard to think. We, we don't work with those percentages the way that you're describing it because we're yeah. just responding to need. It's almost like firefighting yeah. the way our service yeah. goes. So I suppose everything's quite individual and we respond to that need of a person. The kind of stats and stuff, sometimes it's hard to keep track of that for us in the service delivery side that yeah. we're responding to the you need of an individual. not worth grasping because you deal with the sort of day-to-day needs. I think it would be really worth grasping in terms of see at management level, in terms of GP practices, the health board, it is really worthwhile us knowing that yep. and then somehow transmitting the knowledge down to links workers but in terms of what they are doing, they are responding kind of to need as it comes but it's definitely, I would say even just listening to the guys, it is worthwhile us breaking that down Yeah, and for those who might not have listened to our first episode back in April on fuel poverty, we had a links worker there, could you maybe just give a quick description of what, what that role entails for people? Yeah. So really, we are based in GP practices to respond to the needs of an individual. It's generally holistic, non-clinical support. So it's to add to the GP's ability to help people with kind of mm-hmm. social issues um, and holistic uh, model of health. We, we work with an individual based on what their needs are. So it doesn't come from us. It doesn't come from the GP. There'll be a referral reason. And we'll obviously have areas of routine inquiry, which are finance, um, domestic abuse, uh, and they will ask those specific questions. Aside from that, it's really based on what an individual wants to bring up. Mm-hmm. I suppose the important thing about that in terms of cost of living and fuel poverty is mm-hmm. it's coming up a lot. So mm-hmm. people are given a blank canvas to what they want to discuss, yeah. and often that is a priority. Nobody's, yeah. nobody's making that a priority for them. They're coming to us with that priority. So. Yeah. And just before we um, then move into sort of how we see fuel poverty impacting people's health and well-being, um, Kira, you talked a little bit about what you do in terms of research. Mark, do you want to give a brief overview of your sort of role and and how you you're involved in managing fuel poverty and the support that can be offered? Yeah, so Home Energy Scotland is a Scottish government program of advice centres that gives people energy advice. Um, and within that, we have uh, specialist teams based at each of our five advice centres who provide support to people with more complex issues. And uh, very often, those are people who are experiencing uh, fuel poverty. Um, the core focus of the service is giving people high quality energy advice that enables them to take control of their use of energy in the home and also access to funding from Scottish Government for improvements that people can get made to their properties that will make them more energy efficient and will enable them to afford to eat their home. So within that, obviously we are speaking to people frequently who are struggling and who are finding it difficult to afford to heat their home or to pay their bills and are making those difficult choices. So that's the context that we are we're engaged with the issue in. And how then do we see that sort of feeding into people's health and well-being in Scotland? Does anyone want to start off there? 
Yeah, so the Alliance said in October we published a report with the, the very short, snappy and catchy title of Disabled People, Unpaid Carers and the Cost of Living Crisis, uh, Impacts, Responses and solution, Long-Term Solutions. So very, very short yeah. and snappy. Um, but as part of that, we, we did a bit of sort of polling in partnership with Disability Equality Scotland. Um, and we also held a, a specific engagement event where people with lived experience sort of came along and told us directly about their experiences. Um, I think it's worth saying that quite a lot of what people were telling us was very distressing. It was distressing to hear and obviously very clearly a lot more distressing to be in those circumstances. So we're, mm-hmm. we're very grateful people sort of shared those experiences and obviously we're hearing from a lot of people who were struggling to heat their homes and you know that can then have, if your home is cold and damp that can lead to particularly sort of exacerbating chronic pain, it can you know, exacerbate or sort of even cause respiratory conditions and people obviously cutting back on how much they were eating um, again obviously if you're not getting enough food that's just generally bad for your health but if you're getting to the point where you're losing weight you're perhaps getting underweight again you're going to struggle you know to keep yourself warm um, obviously then obviously the, the mental health impact was obviously quite severe as well so people feeling very stressed just about the cost of their bills yeah. but also feeling quite isolated um, a lot of disabled people who use um, mobility aids mm-hmm. so for example if they've got powered wheelchairs we're finding the birds sort of really worried about being able to charge those and if they weren't able to charge those they weren't able to get out and about so they were feeling very isolated and you know a couple of people we've made the point that that was sort of they felt that was almost like that was a breach of their human rights you know that they they have the right to sort of engage in society the right to independent living and if they were feeling sort of you know they couldn't leave their home because they couldn't Mm -hmm. even afford to charge their their wheelchairs that was having a a really severe impact on on just how their their mental well-being was yeah and I suppose, just to maybe to add to that, just to back up, really, because we kind of service delivery, that is backed up in what the Alliance practitioners are telling us. In the Alliance in general and as part of the programme, we are supporting people with long-term conditions, mm-hmm. and these things do get exacerbated, you know, if there's cost yeah. of living uh, issues, fuel poverty. So we, we are hearing that from people as well, yeah. definitely, in, in practice. And the stress can, I'm sure, sort of feed into poorer mental health, which then impacts other health behaviours and, and your ability to sort of take care of yourself well. Um, you sort of touched upon working in the most deprived areas and Mark mentioned there about um, peop- supporting people to feel a sense of control over their energy bills. Um, are we measuring fuel poverty poverty effectively to ensure that those most vulnerable people most in need in these deprived areas are getting access to the support that they need? So I think you talked about um, sort of the prevalence of fuel poverty and if the majority of people are struggling with fuel poverty how do we differentiate the people who are at the highest threshold of risk and i think there is certainly room that we need to revise the definitions um so the definition of extreme fuel poverty for example is, is 20 percent, but we're hearing about people who are spending 50 percent even way more than 20 percent of their income but that does so if you looked at the 2019 data I know it for social housing, and that was about 40% were in fuel poverty. And um, extreme fuel poverty, we're talking um, a little under 20%. So it does halve it slightly within that relationship. Um, So there is still a way to use the definition, essentially, to pick out those people who are at extreme risk of harm um, and who are likely in a really cold home. Mark, would you like to come in on that? I think what, what we try and do is, as I start out by saying, we don't specifically measure to, or, or, or use any assessment that directly measures whether somebody's in fuel poverty. But what we do try and do is work with organisations who are working with people who are more likely to be in or at risk of fuel poverty. Um, and we find that that's a effective proxy for reaching the people who are most vulnerable who would not respond to say traditional marketing approaches so by engaging with organizations that support people with specific health conditions or provide specific support to people we're able to kind of use that to reach those people who are most vulnerable without needing to without needing to but without getting caught up and trying to do a specific assessment on people's circumstances or conditions we, we can use that as an effective way of reaching people and what have you found in terms of people's um health and well-being that you've seen crop up more and more in recent months i think i mean we've, overall we've seen a, a big increase in demand uh for the service um in, particularly in the last 12 months or so um I think the the one thing that, that that's becoming increasingly common is 
people with more complex combinations of uh, of needs. So we're increasingly seeing where people have a combination of struggling with uh, affording the cost of their energy, struggling with the cost of everything else. The cost of energy is, doesn't sit in isolation. You know, it's, it's a combination of the, 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 the cost of, of living in, in general. So we're seeing increasingly cases where people are uh, experiencing debt issues in combination with struggling to afford their, their day to day living costs. Um, and we're also seeing uh, people with more complex issues around specifically things to do with billing and metering, where people have had suppliers go bust and they've been transferred to a supplier of last resort. And that's leaving people with issues where they're not clear, you know, who they owe money to, how much they owe, whether or not credit's been transferred over. So it's, I, I guess it's not unexpected, but the increased pressures on people's day-to-day -day living costs exacerbate the complexities of the issues that they're experiencing and, and make their circumstances more difficult. And in response to that, one of the things that we found is that working more closely with other organisations to make sure people are getting the right bit of support from the right person has, has played a really important role in our advisors making sure that people get the support that they need. Yeah. Yeah. I think you'll see like just a, one example among many Matt talked about that all the food uh, banks are reporting a massive increase in referrals yeah. and so just that's one example we are seeing mm -hmm. but there'll be loads of them. I mean the it's interesting because there's also the the impact on the individual that fuel poverty has can never be overstated but there's the impact on broader society as well if we see increased hospitalizations in high risk groups so children, the elderly, people with disabilities, it's going to put increased pressure on the NHS, which is already overstretched. And also we see that data, a lot of data shows that um, children perform worse in school um, if they come from a household that is fuel poor. And that has a generational impact and can impact their, their job prospects, their earning prospects, and through no fault of their own. We were wondering sort of what about those who do provide health and care across Scotland in the NHS and as carers? How do we see their bills in the home and in terms of travel costs impacting their ability to provide this necessary care? Never mind the increasing pressures from the other side of, of general pop, the general population being more likely to go to hospital. What about those working for the NHS and, and carers as well? How are they being impacted to provide that care? So I can sort of come in very briefly on okay. carers. So on the carer side thing, we've sort of done a bit of work with Scottish Care and they've been saying that one of the things they've found are that sort of care at home workers in particular who are obviously having, you know, they're driving to see the people they're caring for and um, that the significant increase in, for example, the cost of petrol mm -hmm. means that a lot of those, the, the sort of rebate schemes for that haven't been sufficient to keep up with the, the increase in costs. And there are some people who found that they've had to either sort of leave that role entirely or sort of shift where they're working mm -hmm. um, because they can no longer afford to travel to sort of support the people they've previously been supporting. Yeah. And I know that RCN, the Royal College of Nursing's union, has reported that um, from their surveys amidst these pay negotiations, they're finding that nurses are struggling themselves and the nursing workforce are struggling in the cost of living crisis to get to work on time to travel to work and to, to make time to have food for themselves. So it's sort of very basic needs that, that people are struggling to meet now. I think and based on that, a lot of people involved in care haven't got the option from working from home that other people have. Yeah. So they are they are not making some of the savings other people are. Mm -hmm. You know, they've not got that option. This is sort of beyond my role as a researcher, but when I was studying as a student, I worked as a carer um, during the pandemic. And the nature of the shifts of at-home carers is you do three to four hour shifts at a time, maybe sometimes two. Um, and that meant that if you have to travel, um one pound 80 on a bus you know if you're doing three shifts a week that's 10 pound 80 there and back that's that's over an hour's wage that uh, it's not sustainable uh, you can't you can't pay for that kind of travel um and outside of the sort of stark figures of more and more people moving into fuel poverty, how have we seen things change since last April? Um, has the support from the Scottish government increased in line with people's needs? Is it being felt on the ground, on the front line of working with people um, who are struggling with fuel poverty? Um, so 
we saw in, in August and uh, it Scottish the Scottish government expanded the criteria for the warmer home Scotland uh, program which is able to pay for improvements to people's homes to make them more energy efficient um, so that expanded the criteria to make more people eligible uh, in December the we launched the new uh, home energy Scotland grant and loan and that is a change from the previous um, provision that was available to people who didn't qualify for the funded support, which was a loan, an interest-free loan uh, funded by Scottish Government with the cash back. That's now changed to a system of uh, grants of up to £7,500 for people to uh, pay for the installation of either for each of energy efficiency improvements or uh, low carbon technology. And there's also an optional uh, interest-free loan of another 7,500. Um, so there's definitely been uh, additional provision uh, that, that, that's that been made available through uh, Home Energy Scotland. Um, we also work with uh, Fuel Bank Foundation and Advice Direct Scotland, who are able to provide crisis funding for people. Um, that's funding that's provided through Scottish Government um, through the uh, Fuel and Security Fund. Um, uh, and I can't say, you know, too much about the specific amounts that have gone into those funds. But what I can say is we've seen a big increase in the number of people that we are signposting and referring to crisis funding. Um, in the you know the last quarter, I think we were three times we delivered three times more of those kind of types of support to people than we'd uh, been expected to uh, for the year. So th there's definitely a lot more people that we are directing to those avenues of support. And do you think with that increasing to sort of triple triple as much as you expected, is it meeting demand, or do you think? the demand has just skyrocketed in terms of people's needs. Um, can, can I add on that? We've got, we've got, because of the increase in a lot of the funding, we've got very specific partnerships now where mm -hmm. our links workers can distribute vouchers yeah. to a person, which used to we have to maybe go around the houses and go to other organisations. Mm -hmm. Now the fact we've developed these partnerships, there's a lot more funding available for our links practitioners to do it directly. Um, and also safeguarding is a big part of like uh, fuel poverty and stuff. So a lot of stuff like priority services register we're trying to link in with now. People can actually look at things like safeguarding, carbon monoxide detectors as part of an overall, and I'm sure okay. Mark will be, be well versed on that as well. But it's given an opportunity to look at the wider issues as well. A lot of this yeah. funding, in fact, is highlighted. So we are doing a lot of partnership work in that, I think, might not have happened before. A lot of yeah. the support was in place. I think that's a positive to come yeah, out brilliant. of. brilliant. Um, so we've kind of touched on one of the questions, which was what, what support is there for people today in January 2023? Um, and I guess another question would sort of be what, what's missing from this conversation around fuel poverty and what, what more is needed? Well, our project um, works quite closely with uh, two Scottish social housing providers and we're looking at their approaches to addressing fuel poverty. And the, the truth is they don't know who's fuel technically fuel poor. They're more working around the definition of fuel poverty than actually working with it. Um, so they're looking at uh, helping households with children. Uh, before Christmas, they delivered presents to households with kids under 12, one of our housing associations. Um, and I think one of the things that is, is missing is um, what we're talking about is they have a lot of data. And all of that data has a vast potential to act as, as Mark was talking about, as proxy indicators for fuel poverty to stand in place where the definition or who fits the definition is, is an unknown. We can use data in these innovative ways to inform our understanding. I think that can inform a more strategic approach. Um, not that there is anything wrong with how it's being approached right now, but with um, an incoming wave of tenants being unable to afford rent, afford the basic necessities, um, a more strategic approach might be timely and useful. And more effective, possibly. I was just going to sort of come in in terms of the, you know, what's missing from the conversation. I think that mm -hmm. uh, a recognition of the deep roots of the crisis, like I think a lot of the discussion has very much been around this sense that, oh, suddenly there's this war in Ukraine and that's the problem. Mm -hmm. And it, that's very much not the case. You know, we have, for example, you know, decades of 
a lot more limited action on, for example, climate change yeah. than would have been necessary. You know, if we'd cut back on sort of fossil fossil fuel use earlier, you know, then we'd probably be in a, a less severe situation right now. Obviously, there's sort of the impact of austerity over the past decade, yeah. um, and particularly sort of the welfare reforms. You know, that have, you know they've they've frozen, they've cut sort of um, social security payments, and mm-hmm. um, they've you know, tightened the eligibility criteria, which means that a lot of people who are suddenly finding themselves in a really difficult position because of costs of energy. Mm-hmm. The level of support just isn't there, even if they are getting social security payments. It's just not to the level that it should have been mm-hmm. um, if you know there hadn't been those significant reforms. So it's kind of like the focus has been very much that like this is a sort of a crisis that's just come out of nowhere, when in fact it's really deeply rooted in the way that our sort of society and economy has been run over the past few decades that yeah. hasn't really been addressed yet. Yeah, 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 definitely. Um, and sort of as the NHS and social care sector. Struggle with increased winter pressures. How can policy f- funding and action on the ground work to ensure health, the health and social care sector here in Scotland continues to do their necessary work? So, I, in the social housing sector, for example, I know that um, there's rent freezes, um, and that's massively helped tenants. But at the same time, it doesn't alleviate the um, immediate. Um, it doesn't decrease their rent it just stops it from going up essentially but there is also knock-on effects that it means that housing associations don't have that money to then do upgrades on the houses so there's there is a catch-22 there as well so it's just it's a tricky issue to look at how to deliver aid effectively I think in terms of the sort of, you know, the social care side of things, you know, um, there really needs to be a focus on recruitment and retention of staff. So mm-hmm. that the Scottish Government have just launched a, a new campaign to sort of, you know, uh, try and sort of get more people um, into the social care sector, which is really welcome. But that needs to be paired with sort of, you know, further investment in the workforce in general. So, mm-hmm. you know, progress on fair work. So uh, improving salaries, improving career progression mm-hmm. um, opportunities and just sort of improving sort of the recognition and sort of value that society puts on um, yeah. on social care as a sector, which I think hasn't been as high as it as it should be for, you know, the, the, the really valuable work it does do. Yeah. So it's some of those sort of underlying issues that would feed into overcoming this wider challenge of the cost of living and fuel crisis and we've certainly seen that in the NHS as well in terms of there's been a, a growing workforce crisis even even before the pandemic um, that many were concerned about their, the need to address it and again it has been raised recently that um, some of the pay negotiations aren't, aren't supporting dealing with that workforce crisis because some of the largest vacancies are in those higher bands that aren't aren't seeing an increased funding. Um, but although the Scottish Government has, has rightly said they're wanting to increase the, the pay the most for the those poorest earners, um, it's not addressing that underlying workforce crisis, which is, of course, feeling the pressure more and more as, as more people, as Kira was saying, enter into hospital or, or attend A&E during winter as they're struggling to, to pay their bills to keep themselves warm and well. Do you have anything to add on that? But I suppose it's the golden question, isn't it? What, what, what's going to happen moving forward in strategy? Probably all the mm-hmm. stuff we've touched on. Just kill it. I suppose collaboration would be important. I'm thinking we've got people who represent uh, tenants who are renting yeah. from the private sector and stuff. So at the heart of it, there's got to be a lot of collaboration and a lot of sectors coming together to discuss what they can do together rather than yeah. people doing it in isolation. But that's not very specific, just like in a general that collaboration is always going to be important. Yeah, and Mark touched upon that too. Does anyone else want to add in terms of collaborating across sectors to, to achieve this improvement that we need to see? I think it's something that's really important for us is, is collaborating and working in partnership with people from, uh, especially within health and social care, to to spread the word about who we are and what support's available. Um, it's the case with an awful lot of funded support for people that, that that not as many people know about it as they're eligible for it um, and we think that's probably the case for some of the funded support people could access through us um, the, the, the more people knew about it the more people would be able to access it and get the help And what are some initiatives that you guys have seen Mark you've talked about sort of um, what you offer a little bit but what are some other initiatives that people have seen at a local community academic or national level um, that you've seen taking positive action on these um, issues already? We work with some uh, great local organisations, work in partnership with some great local organisations that are uh, community-led, that are delivering uh, support in their communities to give people energy advice. Um, 
there's people like South Seeds in Glasgow, um, uh, Greener Kirkcaldy in uh, over in Fife, um, who you know, and many others um, that that we work with who do do fantastic work, giving people advice in the local communities um, that's kind of tailored to local circumstances. We work with an organisation called Ali Energy, who are uh, based in the small isles, who you know are dealing with really unique circumstances in their communities that are able to do things that that's difficult for other organisations coming from the outside to do so. But th those are the kind of things that, that we think are great that we're really keen to keep working with. I think um, also like the introduction of warm spaces, <clears throat> places like that in communities where they're having um, the island, as some of them are called to start, you know, a warm space, it was about obviously giving folk heat, but I think yeah. teething problems are getting sorted. Um, but there's a lot of that going in communities and organisations who support the kind of wider issues are taking up more of the mantle of well of, of adding a bit of uh, getting like guest speakers in from energy organisations yeah. or um, maybe adding to the kind of food bank provision and stuff. So I think mm -hmm. communities are kind of rising to it, using their own assets, which in our work, community development is a massive part of it. And although you don't want to rely. negate oh. strategy, yeah. you, a community has to rely on itself to a certain extent as well. So there is a lot of good work at that kind of fundamental basic level going on as well. But the strategies and policies have to complement that. You know, yeah. that's the thing, they don't go against it. And in terms of um, avoiding over reliance on community and you know individuals' support, what do you think more the government could be doing from the UK or Scottish government level um, to to provide support down at a local and community yeah. level? I suppose it's hard again. It's probably not not something I've thought about as much of that, but maybe even more engagement. I suppose yeah. there's probably loads going on, but I've not seen in local communities that you know that engagement to what's needed, what might help. Mm -hmm. um, might well be going on but engagement to start off and obviously the basics of making sure that benefits funding welfare funding's a main thing but some sort of engagement even to look at the community for the ideas that their strategy and policy might help yeah rather yeah, than yeah. coming up with funding but there's not really an infrastructure in the communities to support yeah to it. know what works do you think there's a gap in understanding about what's going on in communities and also what what's actually getting it right already probably and there's probably a gap and you know funding gets allocated and kind of blanket a lot of money gets allocated to certain things you know it could probably yeah. be more specific yeah i think how the allocation of funding works rather than a set amount it has to get used by a set time i have one more question if you could make one change today to see real change on the ground for the most vulnerable people in scotland or in your own lives and the work that you do what would that be i think aside for the magic wand aside for the magic wand probably what matt said Probably what we can do as a starting point is make sure what's available people can access. Yeah. You know what I mean? The, the thought of people missing what they're entitled to, I think, is a big thing. So that's mm -hmm. probably, you have to start somewhere, don't you? Yeah. And I think, to me, like you've not got the magic wand, but that's probably quite a good point that Mark mentioned. I probably resonates a bit with myself, thinking about how mm -hmm. we make sure that communities know what's going on and what we've got available. Yeah. I I might cheat and have two because I've got one that is the magic <laughs> wand. One that's, one that's been realistic. So on the sort of realistic side of things, if we're talking about what governments can realistically do in sort of, you know, like they could decide to do tomorrow, it would be sort of enhanced cost of living payments. So one of the things mm -hmm. that the, the Alliance called for in our report was um, sort of £400 payments to anybody receiving a disability, social yeah. security payment, and also to anyone who's getting a carer's payment or the, the new winter um, winter heating payment. Mm -hmm. um, so that was a sort of a, a direct thing that puts money in people's pockets and, and would help address some of the, the current crisis in terms of affordability of energy. But the sort of the magic uh, the magic wand thing, if you could just wave it and all of the necessary sort of investment and infrastructure and building and all that work would, would just be done. It would probably <laughs> be you know, ins insulation and energy efficiency of homes, mm -hmm. um, which would obviously do a lot to, to really support people. So I think there was research out relatively recently that found that in sort of European terms, the UK has sort of the greatest heat loss. So over the course mm -hmm. of like five hours, like an average UK home will lose three degrees. And you right. compare that to, you know, Sweden and Norway, obviously the country's very famed for being pretty chilly. I think mm -hmm. it was like minus 1.2 degrees in Sweden, minus wow. 0 0.9 degree in, in Norway over the same yeah. period. So they're, they're, we're losing like heat three times as fast and that's having a huge impact both on people's ability to stay warm and then obviously, of course, you know, the, the, the cost of their bills. Yeah. I was just going to say, if I had a magic wand, yeah, the, the, definitely one of the things I would uh, I would want would be perfectly everyone to have passive house standard homes that, that cost an absolute minimum to heat because that would well, 
whilst it doesn't do away with poverty, it, it goes a long way to removing fuel poverty as an issue because there's not then a specific issue of the, the, the affordability of heating is the heating is by definition much, much more affordable. So, and we mustn't forget that that also will reduce carbon emissions and help us tackle the climate emergency, which has not and isn't going, going to go away and will probably have impacts that will exacerbate the effects on, on the, the most vulnerable people. I think we've, we've got the aim of getting um, all households to EPC rating of C by 2025. And it, it that sounds like a magic wand. And I think it's interesting you mention passive house because I think it's there's a, a lot of ambiguity to what these actually mean. Um, and there's an inaccessibility to understanding it. But I think one of the useful examples to understanding the uh, efficiency of a passive house is the air exchange is equivalent to a credit card. Whereas the average house in the UK, the air exchange or the air, uh, air leakage from that house is uh, equivalent to an ATM machine, um, which is essentially you might as well have a window open. Um, and we have the most inefficient housing stock in, in Europe and the oldest housing stock in Europe. It, there needs to be significant investment in the fabric of people's homes if we truly want to keep them warm. It's it's not just about payments. It's It's also about increasing the um the investment in our infrastructure i think it's it's a complicated issue and it's not just one problem so it's never going to have one solution the um community level local level intervention is is so valuable um and there's so many other ways there's a myriad of approaches that all need to uh in like convene for we act, for us to actually have a successful solution mm-hmm. for this. so would you like to see sort of increased collaboration to, to bring those all together then? Oh, absolutely. Um, I think for our work with the social housing sector, there's so much informal knowledge that um, needs to be formalized in some way. And that through collaboration would be really useful. I think, um, so we're looking at statistical modes for predicting who's in fuel poverty. And without collaboration, that just wouldn't be viable because you need to understand um, tenancy information, you need to understand building, you need to understand um, people's habits, you need to understand a bit like the psychology behind how uh, people interact with their, their home. Um, and that's so many different sectors all converging in one topic. So there needs to be that cross sector collaboration um, for a solution to actually be coherent. <laughs> yeah. Um- that's all my questions. Is there anything I've not touched upon that someone would like to make a wee point on quickly? Okay, great. Thank you guys all for coming and taking time out to chat to us today. Okay, so now we're joined by Carolyn Hunter, Scottish mum and carer. Um, We spoke to Carolyn previously on the podcast and now she's joining us again today. So... Carolyn, can you tell us a little bit about what's happened over the past few months since we spoke to you last April? Uh, yeah, quite a lot, actually, um, in terms of, for, for me, um, and also with the campaign. I started off in March campaigning, as you know, I've um, spoken to you about that. And it was, it was quite early on. I was doing sort of interviews and lots of media reports, um, trying to get awareness about, you know, of how much of an impact um, the energy crisis is having on our families, you know, who have children with a significant health needs um, and need to use a lot of energy. Um, I think from the last um, interview that I did, the the energy price had went up significantly, significantly in April for me, but also then started to go up again in October. And just prior to that, um, there was a lot of talk about it going up again in January this year and then in April again to significant amounts. So I was doing a lot of campaigning, talking about that, the, the amount it was going to be going up to for, you know, not just for me, but for other families who have children that have sem- similar, um, you know, medical needs. Um, and, you know, I managed to, I managed to speak to a lot of journalists, managed to speak, to, you know, get into a lot of programmes, um, media, and the, um, I think what happened was, the chancellor had changed. I think they put they put the cap on 
was it two and a half thousand um so that did did help but it still meant that you know our average bills weren't going to be you know families like mine weren't going to be sitting at two and a half thousand a year um because that was for an average household um ours are way way above that um so i was um i was quite fortunate in a way where i was able to um to talk about this and as a result of that the um i'm a movie star um supported supported my family in terms of um you know giving us a donation and then a lot of other people donated so that you know our our, our bills would be would be covered unfortunately um you know that that didn't really make any difference to the government and they didn't you know they've not really stepped up and and um you know done anything as a result of that however there has been I, d I did manage to um because of all the media reports i did manage to get a question into the first minister i think it was maybe september that that happened asking you know talking about freya's case um and first minister's questions and asking what support is the scottish government going to give to to families similar to mine um and the first minister replied by saying that she would look at health boards and what support they could put in place and also um thinking about what the uk government could do so um that's that's that was that was in september and then in after the the donation was made i did get a lot of media coverage um in the throughout the world um talking about the energy crisis um and all, obviously there was other countries that were were having the same situation so i was able to to get the message out to and you know to those countries as well um and through that the there was an early day motion raised in parliament in uk the uk parliament um talking about the energy crisis for our families there's 31 mps have signed up to that but it's not went anywhere so i you know i, I do wonder where what what is the point of these early day motions if nobody's going to talk about it um and you know where does that information go but what you know what happens to it because this is ongoing it's not you know it's not being resolved um people are struggling to pay their energy bills they're 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 looking after children with significant health needs they're suffering they're suffering because they're scared that they're going to lose their family their children i was scared up until the point of um kate winslet donating the money to to support us with our bills um i i didn't um i i struggled every day up until that point which is why i was fighting and campaigning to to support other other families not just mine but other families um and and the, and saying to the uk government come on you know let's look at what we can do here um i believe there's been i saw, I saw a report on a bbc website the other day and ministers are talking about a social tariff which is which is a good idea i think a social tariff that can be targeted that can be given provided for um families like myself and other care providers that are struggling with energy bills um however they're only talking about it they've not implemented it um so so i'm working just now with miles briggs who's a conservative msp um the scottish government and a uh, scottish parliament and he's um supporting me with my campaign and he's been able to connect with some of his colleagues down in london to support um to look at supporting um this campaign and thinking about ways in which you know families can be supported similar to mine and you know i'll, t I'll tell my lived experience story um and hopefully that'll um you know enable some some resolve for our families yeah and initially when we checked in with you following our last episode um last year you had said that you'd been in touch with your local council and they hadn't really they'd said they would look into energy efficiency measures but they hadn't made any movement on that for you yet and as you say people are struggling daily mm -hmm. the first minister says she'll look at health boards um she did write to the uk government as well what more do you think the Scottish government and the UK government need to be doing in terms of action rather than discussion? 
Well, I mean, I think there's been there, there was there was significant amounts of money. I think that was um, sort of ring fenced towards energy, you know, helping people with energy bills and also energy efficient homes. And I think, you know, those schemes that they've they've set up, they need to be they need to be rolled out. And I don't think that's happening. Uh, I know that when when I spoke to you before, the I think the council were looking at putting in in uh, solar panels um, and a, a generator and looking at loft insulation, looking at wall insulation and um, looking at all these these things that would possibly help the the situation around my energy efficient because my house isn't energy efficient it's a very old building um which makes it even harder to heat and um you know and it's mo much more expensive high ceilings and stuff so you know and also double glazing but it, it took the council and it took me it took for me to to publicize it in the, on the, in the BB, with the BBC for them to actually do what they, they said they were going to do in April. It took, they, they managed to do it um, eventually in, I think it was late October. That was when it happened in the winter. I mean, you don't, you don't get any benefit from solar panels in the winter. So I had went through the whole summer waiting for them to, to do it and they didn't do it. And because I put pressure on the media, they, they eventually did it. Um, and I think I believe that there was money, there was funding that came because of that um, pressure to that could fund other people who were in a similar situation within my council um, area. And that was good. So that was great. But why does it take somebody like me to be having to, you know, talk about all this on in the media for these things to happen? They should be happening already. You know, families should be identified who are in this situation and they should be supported without anybody having to, to, to talk about it um, in different media, media channels. Um, so it's quite, I think, you know, they need to be looking really seriously at energy efficiency programmes and looking at the most vulnerable families and making sure that they're given that, that support in terms of whatever they need it within their homes, if it's solar panels, if it's, um, you know, loft insulation, double glazing, you know, these these should be provided for for our families who are who are living at the moment, suffering, worrying about how they're going to afford to pay for energy, and they're choosing between do we heat the house or do we, you know, do we eat? And that is really the choices that people are having to make. Um, and also looking at, they're also thinking about are we going to be able to continue to look after our child in in our home, or does our child maybe have to go into hospital? Yeah. yeah, you explained that on on the last episode as well, um, and I'm sure it's incredibly exhausting having to tell that story and to share that you're worried about not just the energy efficiency measures, but having to maybe put Freya into hospital, and then that's in, that's not only incredibly personal, but you said it, it would be an extra cost to the NHS that that could have been avoided had had the council. I'm, I'm glad the council have obviously um, finally reached out, mm -hmm. um, but. October October is a very long time to be waiting and Inclusion Scotland actually um, released a report from serving their members um, in October that the cost of living crisis is catastrophic for disabled people with three quarters of the people surveyed reporting that they can't afford to heat their home even when necessary for their health and well-being and this is something that's necessary and it's, it is great that um, Kate Winslet and other people donated money but how do you feel about the fact that it it came to that to get the necessary support for yourself when you are struggling every single day and it is a basic health and care need. Yeah, I mean, I, I remember the feeling that I had when when that happened and it was, it was absolutely, I don't know, it was overwhelming to the extent where I thought, I can't believe this is happening. It's absolutely amazing that it's happening because I'm no, no longer going to have to worry about losing my daughter. However... There's so many other people throughout the, the the UK, you know, where we live, that are that are feeling like me, and I just I, I, I just thought, why is the government not? No government, Scottish government and UK government are not really. Nobody was talking about it. Nobody's talking about it. There's there's still it's not a priority. It's almost it's 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 not a priority, and it should be a priority because it's people's lives, and. My daughter Freya went into hospital over Christmas because she was very, very sick. She had the flu and I had it as well. 
I wasn't able to look after her in hospital and being parted from her from those for those two weeks and she was in hospital and I know she's not it's not the safest place for Freya to be and that caused me so much stress and it actually had a huge effect on my mental health and I'm only just after a few weeks of counselling from um, from the hospice and from um, my work are very very good at um, supporting me that I'm managing to kind of move on from the way that I was feeling because Freya was she wasn't she wasn't with me and when when you're a parent of a child with significant health needs your child needs to be with you you need to be looking after your child because you know you're the only person that can provide that love and care that your child needs to survive and I don't understand why the government the UK and the Scottish government aren't seeing this as a as a really high priority to make sure that our families are safe and, and not suffering and that's 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 what Kate Winslet did she and everybody else that that donated to 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 help me with my bills was they stopped my suffering that's what they did because that's what's happening at the moment parents and carers of of our children are suffering it's unbearable yeah it's, it's, it is about survival as well and Carers Scotland have also called upon the UK government and the Scottish government to take action for unpaid carers um, reporting that they're sort of spiralling into poverty um, with many people forced to cut back like you said on food and heating and this is something that's sort of not a possibility when you have medical equipment and like you said previously mm-hmm. Freya needs the warmth as part of her care mm-hmm. Um have the support services for carers with the Scottish government's increased like eight million pound of respite funding announced last year. Has that scratched the surface of what's needed, um, or do you think there's a lot more that needs to be done and talked about as well as action? No, there's there's so much needs to be done. But in terms of in terms of respite care and even just um, social care, um, a lot of people are um, because there's no social social care's a mess at the moment. There's, you know, people aren't getting paid enough. They're not valued. Social carers aren't valued at all um, in terms of pay, pay rates. Um, The cost of living is affecting them as well. Let's not forget the people that we are paying £9.90 an hour to have still got the huge energy bills that we've got. Maybe not as big as ours, as mine, because they, you know, I've got high level of medical need in my home, but they are struggling with the cost of living crisis. So if you're, if they're only being paid such a low wage, um, to, to 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 come to work, they're not going to be able to do it. They'll get paid more working in a shop or like in Tesco's, and that's that's what we say, isn't it? You get paid more for stacking shelves than you do for supporting somebody's life. So why I don't understand why the government, both governments, aren't valuing our social care staff because they are just as important as you know. To, for me, my social care staff are are are, are keeping free of comfortable alive and you know safe um that's you know being paid nine pounds 90 an hour isn't isn't enough money you know to 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 pay somebody to make them feel valued yeah and this is something the national care service bill is looking to address but i'd like to ask you you sort of mentioned that you're just getting over the mental health impact of being away from Freya, but also Freya being more ill and in and, and hospital after having gotten the flu. How are you and Freya both doing as of today? We're, we're much better. And the reason that we're much better is because we've had a lot of support. Um, so I've, I've had, the NHS have actually given me um, more sort of support in terms of nursing. So I'm normally the second person, the second nurse that looks after Freya. So there's two people always looking after Freya. And I'm normally, I normally have one person and then I'm, I'm the second person that looks after her in terms of um, Freya's care package. So I've been able to have a bit of, take a bit of a step back because they've allowed other, another member of staff to come in and double up so that I've, not, I've been able to rest. I've, I've had a few weeks off work and Freya's, um, Freya's been home a couple of weeks. The first week she came home was very difficult because she wasn't well when she came home. She was very ill and she needed a lot more intensive care than normal. And it was hard for me because I was still unwell myself, but we've managed to um, 
I think the past week, we, I'd say it's the best, it, we, we felt better, both of us. Freya's been smiling a lot and we went to the hospice. So we went to the hospice on Monday. They, um, they, they, they had us over there and basically they've just looked after us. They've taken care of both of us um, and allowed us to, to kind of recover, you know, in a, in a safe space. Freya's been um, really happy. We've been pampered and it, we, that's what we needed. We need to, we need these resources. Families like us need these resources. Um, and also that, you know, I've had a lot of, been able to speak to the, the staff at, at Rachel House and talk about how I'm feeling um, and what the impact of the, the latest acute situation we had. Um, we've been, I've been able to talk about that and in quite a lot of depth with people that understand um, you know what it's like to look after a child with such an intensive intensive medical needs and yeah I've talked about the energy crisis I've talked about all the things that have been happening in our life in the past few months and um, but it was good to talk about it and it's and you know not everybody has that um, support though um, because there's not enough there's not enough in this country um, there's there's not enough funding goes into these services yeah and you've said um, that a uh, Conservative MSP has been in touch and said he'll have some discussions with people um, down in Westminster, some of his colleagues. Um, has your local MSP been in touch as well? Um, yeah. Do you think enough is happening on that side? Yeah, I think maybe when we spoke last April, I'd been in touch with the, the local MSP, but nothing came from the local MSP. Basically, it was just a case of um, the they had wrote, written to the council and the council had said that we don't have any funding to support you with your energy bill, Carolyn. So sorry. And we, we understand there's a lot of families in your situation, but we don't have any funding. And that's it. That was it. So obviously I kept um, kept up the campaign and I'll, I'll, I'll continue to keep up this campaign. Um, I, know I've, I know that, um, you know, the, the money that was raised, that, that was given to Freya, that's going to cover... Um, the bills for Freya and you know going forward but you know that doesn't stop me from that's not stopped me from continuing the campaign because that's what the campaign was about all, all along it wasn't just about supporting me it was important it was supporting all the other families that are in a similar situation to me um, across across the UK um, I've, I did a little bit of work as well with um, Together for Short Lives before Christmas um, I went. I did. I went down to Westminster and I went to an APPG and met with some MPs um, to talk about the energy crisis and the impact it's having on our families. Um, and that that was quite good. It was quite good to be part of that um, as a parent who's going through, you know, that the situation. I also um, when I, I think it was after after that um, the together for short lives were launching a energy crisis fund for families similar to mine so I stopped the donations coming to Freya um, on her page and I um, diverted people to go to their page to donate to that energy fund so I, I believe when Kate Winslet was talking about me um, in December that that there was a there was a there was a few and um, there was a, there was a lot of money raised I think off the back of that yeah so that was good yeah, and obviously a lot of your sort of campaigning and and raising the discussions about this again and again has meant it's turned up in Parliament and it's turned up um, with our politicians more and more. But do you think the political will is there to to action these discussions and to improve support for carers and for other vulnerable people facing the fuel crisis? Yeah, I, I think there's a, there's probably quite a few people who are very like in you know in, in government that are quite concerned about it and want to make a difference I think there's a lot of people that aren't really listening and they're possibly thinking about other priorities that become that, that come come before for this but I think you know health and social care is it should be top priority that's my view because everybody's good and that's the thing and I, I don't like saying this but there's there's going to come a point in everybody's life where they're going to need this they're going to need these services and when they're not there it's um it's pretty it's not good um and it, you know i know in the in the 13 years of freya's life 
how much I've relied, I rely on uh, health and social care. That's my life. That's why I can sit and talk about this because it's been my life constant. I can talk about, I've, I've, I can talk about it all because I've accessed every service that you can imagine. And I've had every experience that you can imagine. I've had good, I've had bad, I've had, you know, um, and I've been involved in a lot of, um, you know, sort of trying to make it better, sort of, thing, you know. But um, I think that the politicians need to need to really listen to what people are saying. That's why they're in power because they were elected to do to look after the the services that we that that are provided for us to use. And it's you know, that's their job. It's their job to make sure that these work and they they work to the best. That, that they can for people to make sure people are living meaningful and happy and safe lives. Um, but that's not happening. The Equally Valued podcast will return next month as we listen for the voices of experience of people on another health and social care issue in Scotland. A little bit about ourselves before we finish. The Health and Social Care Alliance Scotland is the national intermediary for the third sector, helping our more than 3,000 member organisations to partner with the Scottish Government, the NHS and social care. And Health and Care News Scotland is a news website for Scotland's health and social care sector. You can find us at healthandcare.scot. Thanks for listening.